Good morning and welcome to our second Second Saturday webinar where we will celebrate the Regal Navy family, the Mustons, alongside a 110 year history of the Navy Reserve on the occasion of Vice Admiral John Muston's change of command ceremony, where he has recently relieved Vice Admiral Luke McCollum as the Chief of Navy Reserve. In our program today, you will hear from two distinguished authors who will compare and contrast the 110 year Muston family legacy with the Navy Reserve component. Speaking on behalf of the Muston family will be John Morton, author of Muston, a naval family of the 20th century. Speaking on behalf of the Navy Reserve component will be retired select reserve commander, Dr. Dave Winkler, author of Ready Then, Ready Now, Ready Always, the centennial of the United States Navy Reserve. You will see the change of command and then hear from Vice Admiral Mustin, who will share his commander's intent to his Naval Operational Support Centers in a live feed after the pre-recorded program. The Naval Historical Foundation recognized there was a unique merger of legacies with this ceremony. On one hand, the antecedents of the Navy Reserve came in existence in the 1890s with the formation of the state Naval Militia Units in states located along the coasts and Great Lakes. Then there is the Mustin family legacy that began on October 1st, 1892, when Henry C. Mustin, also known as Naval Aviator 11, arrived at the U.S. Naval Academy for his first year as a midshipman. Enjoy our guest introducers who will provide context for a series of nine segments. During these segments, our two authors will discuss how the reserves and Mustins progressed. Thank you for watching. I'll be back later to moderate the question and answer period. Enjoy. Good morning, Navy Reserve component participants from NOS throughout the United States and viewers of the Naval Historical Foundation's second Saturday program. This is former Chief of Navy Reserve, Vice Admiral John Cotton. Congratulations to Vice Admiral Luke McCullum and best wishes to John Mustin. The quarter century leading to World War I marked a turning point in American history. The United States transformed itself from a regional power to a global power, and it was the development and deployment of a new steel navy that made this transformation possible. Early on, it was recognized that should the nation go to war, there would be a dire need for extra sailors to help operate all of the new weaponry. During the age of sail, the Navy had no problem getting extra hands as the U.S. had a robust merchant marine to draw from and merchant mariner skill sets easily transferred. Not so much in the post-Civil War era that featured a reduced merchant marine and an increasing sophistication of naval weaponry with the arming of ships with torpedoes, the invention of the airplane, and the commissioning of the Navy's first submarine. Meanwhile, in Philadelphia, a young lad sparked by frequent trips to the New Jersey shore expressed an interest in serving at sea. Over to you, Dave and John, for further discussion. Thank you and good morning, everyone, and thanks for tuning in. On February 28, 1890, 172 men formed up a battalion in front of the Massachusetts State House to form the Massachusetts Naval Militia. By 1896, Naval militia units had been formed in 16 states. Addressing Congress in December of that year, President Grover Cleveland praised the naval militia for developing into, quote, a body of enterprising young men, active and energetic in the discharge of their duties and promising great usefulness, end quote. That usefulness would come into play during the Spanish-American War. With combat with the Spanish Navy over the status of Cuba pending, there was an imperative to expand the fleet and recruit additional sailors. Four commercial vessels were acquired, armed and put into service as auxiliary cruisers Yankee, Prairie, Yosemite, and Dixie. They would be crewed by naval militiamen from New York, Massachusetts, Michigan, and Maryland. Meanwhile, naval militiamen from other states crewed old Civil War monitors and converted small craft to provide for harbor defense during the conflict. Overall, this naval reserve asset in the form of naval militias gave good account for themselves during its first decade. However, to be frank, 
During the ensuing decade, the naval militia played only a nominal role in supporting the rise of American sea power as President Theodore Roosevelt sent the Great White Fleet around the world in 1907. Though naval militias made a significant contribution during the Spanish-American War, that conflict also revealed the limitations of the naval militias as each state militia commander reported to the governor of that state. To employ militias for the war against Spain required federalizing the units. In addition, militias focused on harbor defense and were not trained to augment the crews of modern battleships and cruisers that were coming online. Because of these limitations, the Navy initiated legislative efforts to create a Federal Naval Reserve. However, these efforts failed to garner congressional support. In contrast, in the story of the rise of American sea power and the development of new technologies during this era, Henry C. Muston was in the thick of things. For more details, over to you, John. Well, Henry C. Muston graduated from the Naval Academy in 1896, and he had the uh, good fortune uh, to draw as his first duty assignment to the um, armored cruiser New York that was the flagship of the North Atlantic Squadron. The CO at that time was Captain French Chadwick. And Muston was able to utilize his outstanding um, uh, record at the Naval Academy in mechanical drawing. He was first in his class. Um, uh, because when the Maine uh, was blown up in Havana Harbor, a board of inquiry was assembled, and he was assigned to that board of inquiry to uh, to do all the uh, the drawings uh, on the Maine and the explosion and whatnot. And the presiding officer was Captain William T. Sampson, who later uh, was a rear admiral and had command of the squadron, and Muston... Uh, did a great job uh, in his performance of duties with the board, and uh, Sampson selected him to be his admiral's aide, uh, and Muston was able to serve on New York during uh, blockade, bombardment, search, amphibious landing, and fleet engage engagement operations, which gave him a full range of expertise, um, you know, as a result of his early uh, time in combat when the uh, the theater uh, wound down after Santiago, and um, their operations had sort of subsided. Uh, Muston was able to draw duty uh, to uh, be a, uh, assigned to the Pacific Theater, uh, and he got command of the Samar, which was a gunboat that was a prize uh, from the Spaniards. And um, he uh, then participated in a number of operations during the Philippine in insurrection, now uh, called the uh, Philippine-American War. Uh, he had Valores service, and he provided uh, transport, landing, and support to the Army uh, all during those operations. I should say that actually while he was uh, back in, in the Caribbean uh, on New York, he did observe a lot of deficiencies in communications and gunnery, which prompted his later activities uh, as an inventive soul, uh, which I'll get into a little bit later, uh, to do with uh, improvements to ship-to-shore communications, semaphore, and, um, and gun sight uh, uh, inventions. In July 1902, moving a little bit ahead, he was able to secure his fourth uh, flagship assignment, this time to the battleship Kearsage, and he was a turret officer. From there, he went to be a plank owner, uh, on the battleship Kansas in 1907. Uh, he was the ordnance officer, and the Kansas was one of the battleships that went around the world with the Great White Fleet. When he returned in October 1909, he was ordered to the Philadelphia Navy Yard for aud ordnance uh, duty, where he did a lot of his uh, development of his gun sights and patents on his own time. His family was from Philadelphia and um, uh, people of stature, and one of the things that was happening in Philadelphia at that time was a lot of society people were getting into aviation. And in fact, Muston's young bride was one of the first women in America who was able to go up in an uh, airplane. Uh, and uh, so she and Muston uh, became very active in learning how to fly, at least Henry C. Muston. And um, Sims at that time had recognized already the potential uh, that aviation, naval aviation, would have for uh, scouting in particular and spotting. 
And Mustin, in his own right, uh, developed a, an interest in trying to promote the Navy to use both hydroplanes and over overland airplanes uh, in various capacities. Uh, so he was really one of the um, forerunners in the Navy of promoting naval aviation for a variety of, uh, of operations. In December 19, 1913, he became the executive officer with acting command of the battleship Mississippi. And uh, part of that was because it was assigned to uh, be the station ship at Pensacola, where uh, they were developing uh, the naval training uh, that was down there at that time, which sort of brings us up to right the beginning of the uh, First World War. Hello, this is Rear Admiral Julius Caesar. I'm a proud 34-year veteran of both the active and reserve components of the United States Navy. Good morning, Navy reservists and viewers of the Naval Historical Foundation's second Saturday program. I'd like to extend my warmest congratulations to Vice Admiral Luke McCollum for a job well done and best wishes to John Mustin on his well-deserved assumption of command. The assassination of Arch Archduke Ferdinand of Austria-Hungary on June 28, 1914, did a powder keg that would erupt into a global war where surface, aviation, and undersea warfare would impact the outcome. The United States would remain neutral until April 1917. With the defeat of Russia later in 1917, the Germans could concentrate their battle-tested armies on the Western Front. The question was, could the United States mobilize fast enough to stave off defeat? Over to Dave and John for their expert analysis. Indeed, the outbreak of war in Europe finally generated enough support for Congress to pass legislation on March 3rd 1915 to establish a naval reserve that was initially open to enlisted sailors who had recently left active duty. Given the paltry amount of former sailors who signed up for this new outfit, new legislation was passed on August 1916, creating six categories of individuals who could join the Naval Reserve Force, greatly expanding the talent pool from which the Navy could draw on, even to include women. With the declaration of war on April 6, 1917 against Germany, this new Naval Reserve Force, as well as Naval militias, were called on to active duty and immediately contributed to the war effort. Ironically, most of the regular Naval officers and enlisted sailors assigned to battleships and cruisers sat idle and never got into combat as the German high seas fleet stayed in port. Instead, we had students from Yale form a Naval Reserve Aviation Unit, Militias made up of Big Ten school students firing railway guns in France, and all sorts of reservists serving on converted yachts and small craft that were chasing German submarines in the Atlantic. And then there were the women. They were dubbed Yeoman Fs or Yeomanettes. By the end of the war, we had nearly a half million sailors in uniform. Over half of them were naval reservists. As noted, aviation would become an important component of World War I, for more about how Henry Mustard became part of that story, I'm going to turn it over to John. When we get to April 1914, Henry C. Mustin is still down in Pensacola, and um, during the uh, Veracruz operation, uh, he got orders uh, to take the Mississippi down to uh, Mexican waters to provide in Veracruz uh, aviation support during the intervention. Uh, the significance of that for naval aviation and Henry C. Mustin is this. It was the first use of naval air aircraft supporting military operations in a combat environment. Uh, they, his unit provided 48 days of continuous flying in all weather, which proved a lot of capability. When he returned to Pensacola um, with the station ship North Carolina, which was an armored cruiser, uh, he uh, went into uh, the history books as piloting the first cat shot from a station ship, uh, from a ship uh, that was actually underway, and that was the North Carolina, and that, that catapult shot took place on 5 November 1915. Um, later, Josephus Daniels, who was the uh, Secretary of the Navy, was seeking ideas for uh, attacking the German submarine pens, the German submarine obviously being the, uh, uh, the real uh, threat uh, to the Allied forces, the, the, the British, 
um, in getting their resupply, and they needed ideas on how they could attack the submarine pens that were on the British on the English Channel. And so Daniels uh, circulated a request uh, for ideas in August 1917, and Mustin came up with backing from Admiral Sims, uh, who was commander of naval forces over there in, uh, in Europe, U.S. naval forces, backing to use uh, land-based planes on sleds, sea sleds that would be towed by uh, uh, fast boats. And these, these planes would get up the speed on the sea sleds uh, where they would be able to mount uh, an offensive operation as a tactical unit to attack the submarine pens. A very bold uh, plan. And they worked on this for almost a year. However, the armistice came before the operation could be mounted. Um, but that uh, was demonstrative of uh, Mustin's genius and uh, it would carry him a long way in the post-war world uh, in his career, and you'll see that in later, uh, later slides. Good morning. This is former Undersecretary of the Navy, Dino Avalos. In addition to my civilian service with the Navy Secretariat, I'm also a proudly retired Navy captain from the reserve component. It's my sincere pleasure to offer my heartfelt congratulations and fair winds to my Naval Academy classmate, Vice Admiral Luke McCallum and his family as well as my warmest welcome aboard to Admiral John Mustin and his family. The end of World War I ushered in an era of hope for the peaceful resolution of future conflicts through the creation of a League of Nations and associated international agreements, such as the Washington Naval Arms Conference, where nations agreed to restrict the size and composition of the warships and their fleets in order to curb escalatory and inflammatory arms races. Recovering from the devastation of the First World War, the world, and especially the United States in the 1920s, enjoyed a significant, peaceful economic expansion that was immediately followed by the crushing global depression of the 1930s. The Naval Reserve Force would need to adapt and restructure to address this harsh new reality. The era also figured significant milestones for the Mustin family story. Well, the end of World War I left the Navy with a huge pool of Naval Reservists, which a newly elected Congress in 1921 did not want to pay for. Hence, at the end of September 1921, some 200,000 enlisted and 25,000 officers were taken out of drill pay status. Efforts to reorganize the Naval Reserve finally led to the passage of the Naval Reserve Act of 1925 that set up a fleet naval reserve of officers and sailors who would augment ships, crews, do national emergencies, a merchant marine naval reserve to create a cadre of mariners who could place merchant ships into naval service during wartime, and volunteer naval reserves as a pool of individuals who could do specialized work during wartime. The 1920s marked two other significant milestones in naval reserve history. The creation of NROTC units at Harvard, Yale, Northwestern, Georgia Tech, University of Washington, and Cal Berkeley. In addition, the first Naval Reserve air stations were set up near Boston, New York, and Chicago. The 1930s marked a decade of stability, growth, and innovation for the Naval Reserve, though budget issues did limit some annual training opportunities. The innovation that would play a significant contribution was the creation of a Naval Air Cadet Program in 1935. Civilians could enlist in the Navy and, if qualified, undergo flight training, and upon receiving his wings of gold, serve in the fleet for three years. The thousands of pilots that received their flight training this way, by way of this program would play a pivotal role in the up oncoming global war. It's a global war Henry Mustin would not be part of, but his son Lloyd would be. John, tell us about the arrival of this second generation of Mustins. Well, in the post-war period, uh, Henry C. Mustin was very much involved in the development of air policy in the Navy. The uh, Naval Policy um, um, uh, Summit in the Navy uh, since uh, 1900 was the general board of uh, senior admirals uh, with a staff of uh, senior captains and whatnot. Uh, and Mustin, in both 1916 and after the war in 1919, testified before the general board and uh, was developing uh, 
the air policy for the Navy that uh, would get into the characteristics, uh, if you will, of the aircraft. And, and he was uh, interested in trying to present to the Navy the idea for three types of shipboard aircraft on carriers um, that would serve as strike weapon systems in, uh, in contemporary terms. So again, he's pushing the idea of, air for, of uh, aviation as an offensive capability, tactical units, um, and the three types of shipboard aircraft he was looking for were um, an aircraft that would do scouting and spotting, uh, a torpedo bomber, and a fighter. Um, so that's fairly prescient uh, and very early on. He had duty uh, with aviation out in Coronado and North Island, uh, but he came back in 1921 uh, to serve in the newly established Bureau of Aeronautics. And at Buair, uh, he fought the fight to preserve a separate avi naval aviation um, uh, 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 program uh, within the Navy, uh, as opposed to consolidating with the Army Air Corps, as some people were trying to do, and he pushed for aircraft carriers. And this was at a time uh, where there was naval disarmament and uh, the uh, battleships uh, were not being uh, built uh, because of the various disarmament conferences in Washington and London. So people were putting you know, emphasis on the idea of carriers now. So they'd really caught up with Mustin. What happened, alas, is that he uh, succumbed to uh, um, uh, cardiovascular uh, failure in 1923, and alas, we lost Henry C. Mustin at, at a very early age in his 50s. However, his legacy lived on and finally arrived in 1930 uh, when the Navy exercised uh, offensive fast carrier operations around a complete tactical unit. Um, so that's seven years after uh, he left this earth, and in 1932, in a very famous uh, annual Army-Navy exercise, Rear Admiral Henry Yarnell demonstrated conclusively uh, the efficacy of a two-carrier strike on Pearl Harbor. Uh, his legacy, personally, was inherited by his eldest son, Lloyd Mustin, uh, who graduated from the Naval Academy in 1932. His first assignment out of the Naval Academy uh, was to Commander Chester Nimitz Augusta, which was the uh, cruiser that was the uh, Asiatic Fleet flagship. And he learned a lot from Nimitz, uh, which he applied in his career throughout. He later uh, drew duty as the commissioning on the commissioning crew of the Lampson. Uh, a destroyer as an assistant gunnery officer. By this time, he was uh, uh, reasonably expert for his level in ordnance and gunnery, and it led actually to his interest in anti-air warfare. Uh, they did a lot of training at that time on the Lampson uh, in that area, and from there, he went to the postgraduate school. The PG school at that time was at the U.S. Naval Academy, uh, and then the second year, you'd go out to other organizations and institutions uh, for further training. And in this case, uh, he was able to draw assignment to MIT, where he worked on technologies for rapid and uh, accurate uh, anti-aircraft war, uh, anti AAW fire control. Uh, he worked with Charles Stark Draper, uh, and um, it led to a lot of uh, his design activities later. Uh, one of which was uh, when he was assigned to Buord, he went down to Dalgren, where he was directing the design and production and the inspection of the 1.1 Mark I Mod II close-in air defense machine gun. Uh, his MIT work actually later went right into the fleet as components for the gun sights for the 20 millimeter mounts and the Mark 51 director for the uh, 40 millimeter twin and quad mounts. So Lloyd's, you know, uh, legacy uh, at that time from uh, in his career kind of transferred into the fleet and made a, a big difference in some of the AAW activities uh, uh, against the Japanese uh, out there in the Pacific theater. My name is Rear Admiral Christopher Paul. Good morning to our foundation members and especially our reserve component sailors who are viewing from NOS all over our great nation. During these difficult times, we take time out to celebrate a United States Navy 
time-honored tradition, a change of command. My wife, Shannon, and I would like to send our best wishes and warmest congratulations to our dear friends, Vice Admiral Luke and Leanna McCollum, and their family for the outstanding accomplishments that he achieved during his significant tenure as Chief of the Navy Reserve. And we also welcome Vice Admiral John and Kim Mustin and their family members as he assumes the helm of the United States Navy Reserves as its new chief. I have closely observed Vice Admiral John Mustin for nearly two decades and can attest to his outstanding character and leadership and assure you that he will lead you all to great heights. As we look back, the 1930s is remembered as a decade that saw the rise of militaristic regimes in Japan and Germany. During this time, Japan would seek to expand its territory in China, and Adolf Hitler launched the invasion of Poland in September 1939. And on December 7, 1941, the Japanese bombed the United States Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor, forcing the United States into its second world war of the century. Over the next four years of the conflict would cost the United States over 400,000 servicemen killed in the efforts to defeat Nazi Germany, Italy, and Imperial Japan. Our nation has shared its treasures and ideals and shed the blood of its finest patriots. Many were United States Navy reservists to help make a better world. Now, let me turn you over to our two authors. Thank you. Well, you can say that during World War II, the Naval Reserve didn't exist, yet that Naval Reservists provided the majority of the officer and enlisted personnel who made victory at sea possible during World War II. Of course, the reason the Naval Reserve no longer existed is that they were all mobilized during the National Emergency Declaration in the spring of 1941. Indeed, the first shot on December 7th was not fired by the Japanese, but by Naval Reservists from Minnesota, assigned to a gun crew on the destroyer Ward who fired on and sank a Japanese mini-sub that was trying to enter Pearl Harbor. Later that year, during the Battle of Midway, some 90% of the pilots who earned their commissions from the Navy Reserve training programs were involved in that pivotal battle that turned the tide of the Pacific. To place men under arms, the country instituted a draft under Selective Service Act, and men who were drafted into the Navy were given a choice of enlisted into the regular Navy, which subjected you to serve at least four years, being inducted into the Navy, meaning that you can get released at, when the war ended, but you can be subjected to another draft, or join the Naval Reserve, meaning that you were exempt from the draft uh, at the end of the war, but you can get recalled in a crisis. 84.5% chose the latter option. Meanwhile, to develop officers to fly aircraft and lead all these enlisted sailors at sea, innovative officer training programs, such as the V-12 program that used college campuses as training facilities, produced nearly 300,000 officers. Because the two ocean war required total mobilization of human resources, gender and racial barriers were broken. Women who served with the WAVES, an acronym for Women Accepted for Volunteer Emergency Service, joined the ranks of the Navy. As for African Americans joining the ranks, Paul Stilwell documents their story in his fine book, The Golden Thirteen. I'm proud to say that one of those African American officers, Vice Admiral Sam Gravely, having earned his gold bars during World War II, would rise to the ranks and commission yours truly. Naval reservists built up the bulk of the most powerful naval force the world had ever witnessed. As for Lloyd Mustin, he would be spending much of the war fighting alongside these reservists. Here's John to tell you what he did. When war came, Lloyd Mustin was well and truly uh, a gun boss. Uh, he was ordered to the commissioning crew of the Atlanta, which is a light cruiser, but it, uh, uh, its main turrets were all five inch and uh, it was an anti-aircraft cruiser, which is fitting. He was the assistant gunnery officer and his first action was in August 1942 uh, in the Battle of the Eastern Solomons. Um, but uh, it was the naval battle of Guadalcanal uh, where he really saw uh, close quarters combat, uh, which was uh, a night action, very famous. It was a night melee. 
Um, the ship was uh, horrifically damaged, uh, as were many, and uh, it later uh, had to be scuttled. So uh, it was his baptism of fire, and uh, uh, he really went through it. Uh, he was on Guadalcanal for a number of months uh, working with the Marines and uh, the Navy folks uh, who were on shore, uh, and he was uh, helping out in the gun batteries there with his uh, gun gunnery skills. Uh, he later was ordered to the commissioning crew of another light cruiser, but this one was uh, uh, had uh, six-inch main batteries. He was the assistant gunnery officer on Miami, and he saw a lot of action on Miami uh, in the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot, Lady Gulf. In October 1944, he was ordered to the staff of the Pacific's Fast Battleships Commander, uh, Vice Admiral Willis Lee, uh, as Lee's gunnery radar and CIC officer. And in those uh, year, those uh, months with uh, Admiral Lee, he participated notably in the Iwo Jima and Okinawa campaigns. Hello, this is B.J. Penn, former acting secretary of the Navy. Um, before that, I was assistant secretary of the Navy for installations and environment. Retired Navy captain, uh, last operational flying, was in the initial EA-6B Prowler Squadron. And yes, before I left the administration, I did go to Pax River and fly the Growler, thanks to the Navy Reserves. I am also a member of the Navy Historic Foundation's Board of Directors. Good morning, Navy Reservists and viewers of the Navy Historical Foundation's second Saturday program. I'd like to extend my warmest congratulations to Vice Admiral Luke McCollum and John Mustin on their change command to the Naval Reserve Force. With victory achieved following the surrender of Japan and no more naval threats on the horizon, millions of men and women were released from duty. As a result, during the post-war period, the Navy became a shadow of its former self. Sadly, when peace did arrive, a new opponent emerged as a former ally during World War II, but did not share the American vision that the liberated states in Eastern Europe and elsewhere had a right to self-determination. Then the 1950s came with the Korean War. To discuss the end of World War II and the emerging Cold War's impact on the Naval Reserve and Lloyd Mustin, let's turn to Dave and John. With millions of sailors being discharged and placed back into reserve status, the late 1940s became a golden era for the Naval Reserve in that new reserve centers and airfields had to be placed in the service to support the hundreds of new units and air squadrons that were being created. Thus, the North Koreans made a grave miscalculation when they invaded South Korea on June 25, 1950. Though active duty forces had been hollowed out after World War II, there still existed a huge fleet of mothballed warships and naval reservists who retained their seafaring skill sets from the Second World War. Within the first six months of the war, 198,000 naval reservists would once again don their uniforms. Thus, the American-led United Nations effort to drive back the initial North Korean attack and withstand the subsequent Chinese intervention can be credited in good part uh, to its reserve components. For example, on the carrier Boxer, the number of pilots who were naval reservists were 90%. And on the Bohon Richard, 100%. When the Korean War ended in July 1953, the Naval Reserve turned to meet the threats posed by the Soviet Union, specifically its growing submarine force. Both Naval Reserve surface and aviation components began to focus on anti submarine warfare. As for the Mustins, over to you, John. Well, in the post-war Navy, uh, Lloyd Mustin emerged um, with uh, two uh, developing skill sets. Um, as Dave mentioned, uh, the uh, AAW skill set that he moved into came from his love of uh, smaller ships, destroyers. Unlike his father and many naval officers of um, uh, the preceding generations uh, who were drawn to the battleships, uh, Lloyd was always drawn to uh, the destroyers. 
And um, he, I think, uh, of all things, prided himself on being a destroyer man, as did his son, uh, Hank Mustin. Lloyd also um, developed uh, an understanding early on of the dynamics of, uh, of Washington and the uh, internal negotiations within the Navy and also vis-a-vis -vis the other services. Uh, and it, when he came out of the war, his first duty that he drew was uh, to the Bureau of Ordnance. And at Bureau Ord, he worked on uh, AAW fire control. Uh, he went on from working at Buord to being the uh, CEO of the Kepler uh, destroyer, which introduced him to now uh, ASW. And that was followed by a, a tour on the Deslant staff as the ASW officer, where he was beginning to develop ASW tactics. From there, he went back to Washington, uh, serving on what was called the Weapon System Evaluation Group. Wessig, where he battled with the uh, uh, Air Force and civilian analysts over the strategic mission. It was a frustrating tour for him. Uh, however, he was very delighted to get back to the Pacific to be a destroyer man. He had two back-to-back -back tours. He became the uh, CEO of the Piedmont uh, destroyer tender, uh, and followed by uh, command of uh, Desron 13, destroyer squadron. Uh, so that sort of rounded out his uh, early and mid-50s time uh, at sea, uh, again, uh, focusing on destroyers, initially on AAW, uh, but uh, subsequently in the ASW area. Good morning. I am Rear Admiral Jack Natter, who served in both the active and the reserve components of our Navy. I extend my warmest congratulations to both Vice Admiral Luke McCullen and Vice Admiral John Muston on the change of command of our Naval Reserve Force. The end of the Korean War was followed by a growing arms race with the Soviet Union. Under the leadership of President Dwight D. Eisenhower, the United States adopted a new look strategy dependent upon nuclear weapons. With the election of a former Naval Reservist, John F. Kennedy in 1960, the Soviets were quick to challenge this young president and Europe and in the Caribbean that threatened to embroil this nation in a third world war. In response, the new president ditched the new look strategy for a flexible response strategy dependent upon conventional forces. However, the conflict that would be most associated with that decade and two other presidents who had served in the Naval Reserve, Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon would occur in Southeast Asia in a country called Vietnam, in which many of us were involved, including myself and six of my brothers. John, Dave, I stand relieved. The crisis in Europe in 1961 was the building of a wall between East and West Berlin and Soviet demands that the US, Britain, and France remove their token forces from West Berlin. Among the measures taken against the Soviet Union, President Kennedy activated nearly a quarter million reservists and National Guardsmen. The Naval Reserve, this meant the activation of reservists trained in the art of anti-submarine warfare. While the recoil of reservists for this threat and the subsequent Cuban Missile Crisis did show resolve to the Soviets and contributed to their decisions to back down, the recalls would have domestic political repercussions in that the national leaders would show a reluctance to employ reserve forces during the Vietnam conflict. Except for the recall of two CB battalions, the Naval Reserve would provide only indirect support for the conflict in Southeast Asia. That said, individuals who were USNR on active duty status would be in the thick of things in the skies, on the ground, and off the coast uh, in Vietnam, as illustrated by Everett Alvarez Jr., a Naval Reserve pilot would remain in captivity the longest of all Americans captured and kept in North Vietnam in the Hanoi Hilton. No doubt, a lot of these reservists would be serving with another uh, Henry Mustin and his younger brother Tom, who both would be serving in country. Tell us more about this new generation of Mustins and what's uh, happening with the older uh, Lloyd Mustin. I'm going to turn it back over to John. He made two star um, in 1958 and uh, he advanced to command uh, Desflot 2, Destroyer Flotilla, uh, Destroyer Flotilla 2, which was the Atlantic's ASW and Convoy Escort Flotilla. However, 
what happened uh, right away before he was able to get down to business uh, with his uh, command, he was um, uh, the recipient of a presidential order to command Task Force 88, uh, which was uh, charged to conduct um, the AECs, the Atomic Energy Commission's Operation Argus, uh, that was uh, eventually launching three successful test firings uh, of missiles to detonate nuclear warheads in the upper atmosphere. It was a highly secret uh, operation uh, that was uh, carried out uh, uh, and it was, the, it was masked by the International Geophysical Year, uh, but it was successful in, in, uh, in, in all the tests. Uh, and later he was invited by uh, CNO Arlie Burke uh, to come on his staff uh, at OPNAV to uh, work uh, the ASW issues uh, uh, that they were developing at the time. After the Soviet Union started a blitz of nuclear testing um, uh, in 1962, um, Lloyd became the Navy's operational commander under JTF-8 uh, to support the AEC and DASA's domestic Dominic tests. Uh, the Defense Atomic Support Agency. Uh, his responsibility was the operational um, end of the Polaris test shot, uh, among other things, uh, which was the only U.S. strategic missile ever shot uh, and detonated uh, with a nuclear warhead, and uh, the ASROC shot. Uh, similarly, that was uh, shot with a W-44 nuclear warhead. So Lloyd Mustin uh, among the Dominic tests, uh, test fired and, uh, and detonated, uh, warheads, uh, in an operational, um, set of exercises, those two. In May, 1964 to May, 1967, Lloyd got, Lloyd got his third star and, uh, he became a J3, uh, during Vietnam and his main focus was on the air operations the targeting, and the weapons selection. Needless to say, uh, it was a frustrating tour for him. Uh, afterwards, in 1967, he went off to serve as the Fibland commander down at Little Creek, uh, and he finished his career uh, at DESA, drawing again on his, uh, his record uh, in atomic testing, uh, uh, retiring in 1971. But as uh, Dave Winkler uh, noted, uh, we have coming online Hank Mustin, his eldest son, who was a Naval Academy graduate in 1955. His first ship after graduating and commissioning uh, was to serve on the uh, uh, radar picket destroyer Duncan out in, um, in San Diego. As a JG, uh, he got to assignment to be the CEO of uh, Bunting. Uh, a coastal mine hunter um, that was uh, home ported in uh, on the Atlantic. From there, he went to PG school, where he took a double E uh, at a time of uh, the transition from tubes to transistors. Uh, so he was moving very much in sync with where the Navy was going in terms of its electronics. Um, he became um, the chief engineer and later the weapons officer as uh, part of the commissioning crew of Lawrence, uh, which was a guided missile destroyer, DDG-4. Uh, as a freshly min minted uh, lieutenant commander, uh, he became the executive officer of a new construction uh, DDG, the Cunningham. After uh, he went to the Naval War College, uh, he volunteered for Vietnam in 1966. Um, that is unusual, uh, because, uh, for the most part, uh, at that time, detailers were not sending Naval Academy graduates to Vietnam, but Hank wanted to be where the action was, uh, as had been his, uh, grandfather's example and namesake and, uh, and Lloyd's. Uh, he became the chief staff officer, uh, in the Mekong Delta during market time and game warden for, uh, TG 116.1. From his time in the in the Delta, he uh, was selected to be uh, Ole Sharp's uh, flag lieutenant uh, at a time when uh, Sharp was the uh, uh, commander in chief of the U.S. Pacific Command. From there, he went to be the CEO of the Henry B. Wilson, 
another guided missile destroyer, and he served on the gun line. Um, so he was providing naval gunfire support uh, at that time, principally to uh, um, uh, South Vietnamese forces. Hello, I'm Dirk Deving, former commander of the Navy Reserve Force and the 12th Chief of Navy Reserve. Good morning to all of our Navy Reserve sailors and NASCs all over the United States and to all viewers of the Naval Historical Foundation Second Saturday program. Terry and I extend our warmest congratulations to Vice Admirals Luke McCollum and John Mustin on their transition of the Navy, Force, Navy Reserve Force leadership that occurred at the Washington Navy Yard. Shortly after I began my Navy career in the early 1970s, a former, former Naval Reserve officer became president, Gerald R. Ford and he was succeeded by a Naval Academy graduate, Jimmy Carter. Having left the Vietnam conflict in its wake, the American, American military had to regroup in the 1970s as an all-volunteer force as the nation continued to face the Soviet threat and then instability in the Middle East, as witnessed by the October 1973 Yom Kippur War and then the fall of the Shah of Iran in the late 1970s. With the election of President Reagan came a Secretary of the Navy, John Lehman, who also happened to be a Navy Reserve sailor. In the meantime, we pursued a strategy against the Soviet Union that we called the Maritime Strategy. Vice Admiral Hank Mustin was one of the admirals that made that strategy a reality. Over to you, Dave and John. During the 1970s, the total force policy, one Navy concept emerged. A lesson from the Vietnam conflict was that if a nation is to go to war, it needs to be an effort worthy of public support through its willingness to mobilize its citizen sailors, soldiers, Marines, and airmen. To oversee the transformation of the reserve into a ready mobilization asset, the new office of Chief of Naval Reserve was created. It's the office that Vice Admiral John Mustin just assumed as the 15th Chief of Naval Reserve. During the 1980s, under the Reagan administration, there was a buildup of American military might which for the Navy met a goal of building a 600-ship Navy. One of Secretary of the Navy John Lehman's priorities was to upgrade the Naval Reserve so that it could seamlessly integrate with the active duty forces if called on. Thus, instead of receiving hand-me-downs, many reserve units received aircraft and ships that had just come off the production line. Many argue that the Soviet Union simply could not keep pace with the American buildup that led to the demise in the end of, at the end of the decade. Elsewhere, the nation faced challenges in the Middle East where Iraq and Iran were engaged in a war in the Gulf. Unfortunately, with the need for minesweeping assets to clear Iranian mines, minesweepers assigned to the Naval Reserve were used, but without their crews. The recall mechanisms that needed to be Bring those sailors on active duty would finally be worked out in the next decade. As for uh, uh, John Mustin's father, during the 1970s and 80s, I'm going to turn it over to John. After his time um, in uh, Westpac and uh, in command of the Henry B. Wilson, um, Hank got to um, OPNAV uh, with Admiral Zumwalt, who was the CNO at the time. And he served on uh, Admiral Zumwalt's CNO executive board, uh, and his uh, issue area was uh, ASUW, um, anti-surface uh, warfare. So with Admiral Zumwalt, uh, Hank was developing the idea of strike forces uh, that would somehow uh, work together with your um, attack submarines, uh, developing the uh, NTDS, uh, the Naval Tactical Data System, uh, the Tomahawk, uh, the coming online of Aegis, uh, the Slick 32, the Phalanx, the uh, Mark 45, 5-inch 54, towed ASW arrays. From his time at OPNAV, uh, Hank then went to be the executive assistant to Admiral Dave Bagley, uh, a member of another very distinguished multi-generation naval family like the Mustins. And uh, Admiral Bagley at that time was the commander-in-chief of uh, U.S. Naval Forces Europe. And Hank went from uh, the Admiral's staff to be the CEO of Deseron 12 and to bring it up to operational speed so that it could begin to uh, develop a, a forward capability that somehow 
would be able to put a marker down uh, in the eastern Mediterranean vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the Soviet presence there. He returned to OPNAV uh, under the uh, Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Surface Warfare at the time, Vice Admiral Jim Doyle. Um, Hank arrived uh, to be the head for Admiral Doyle of Combat Support and Re Readiness. Um, he went from there to be the CO of uh, Cruiser uh, Destroyer Group 2, where he developed some of the operational concepts uh, for this new era of AW and Tomahawk tactics. Um, this put him in position uh, later to become the uh, commander of the Second Fleet, uh, where he would prove the maritime strategy. And this is how he did it. He developed operational concepts around the Aegis, and most famously with Ocean Safari 85, uh, he took uh, the strike forces of the Second Fleet and their allies to operate in the fjords in uh, Norway, where they were able to take advantage of radar shadowing and fine tune the NATO force structure and ROEs. Uh, he left uh, uh, command of Second Fleet to return to Washington uh, to be the Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Strategy Plans and Policy. It's safe to say that Hank was piloting uh, and helping to pilot the Navy into the new era. Uh, he saw the Soviets were shifting from threatening the Fulda Gap to uh, kind of an economic warfare approach, uh, which uh, meant that the action was going to shift to oil in the Persian Gulf. Remember, we're still thinking in terms of uh, the Cold War bipolarity. So Hank was one of these people at this time that was shifting a focus uh, from the open ocean sea control of the past uh, to operations uh, in the literals, literal warfare. And so uh, he was one of the guys at that time that was looking at uh, how Aegis would function in the literals, uh, both in terms of AAW and land, land attack uh, tomahawks. A major contribution. Uh, to the thinking as we were moving into the post-war, uh, post-Cold War era. Good afternoon. I am John Todeshek, a former commander of the Naval Reserve Force. It's my great pleasure to participate in this webinar honoring the change of command of Luke McCollum and John Muston. I extend my warmest congratulations to both Luke and John for this important milestone for our Navy Reserve Force. To Luke, bravo Zulu and a tremendous job. Well done. For John, best wishes for a great command tenure ahead. I'm sure this will be your greatest command yet and possibly your most challenging. Though the collapse of the Soviet Union marked the end of the Cold War, the last decade of the last millennium would be marked by conflict in the Middle East and the Balkans. On 2 August 1990, Iraq, under the leadership of Saddam Hussein, invaded Kuwait. The U.S. and global response would be swift and decisive. However, though Hussein's forces were removed from Kuwait, he would continue to be a threat. In the Balkans, war broke out between the former states of Yugoslavia that had to be resolved. Again, the Naval Reserve and the Mustans would be involved. And with that, I'll pass this over to our authors. Indeed, the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait would lead to the largest recall of naval reservists since the Korean War. Of note, nearly half of the naval reservists recalled supported medical units. Thankfully, the brilliantly executed Operation Desert Storm meant that there were fewer, fewer wounded than were needed to be cared for. Among the assets the naval reserve brought to the table was port security in the form of mobile inshore and sea warfare units, naval reserve logistical squadrons, mine sweeping assets, as well as public affairs support for General Norman Schwarzkopf. As the decade pressed on, Naval Reservists would continue to provide support to the active forces that continued to operate in the Middle East and the Adriatic. John, I understand with the 1990s, a new generation of Mustans were beginning to come on online. A fourth generation of Mustans came online indeed. Um, the first was Lloyd Mustin, Hank's uh, eldest son, who uh, graduated uh, from OCS in 1981, got his commission, and was assigned to a Pratt DDG-44 uh, and uh, went on to get his qualifications as a surface warfare officer. 
And as a SWO, he served as the Pratt's uh, assistant gunnery officer, a gunnery officer and first lieutenant. Um, he transferred to the Naval Reserves in uh, 1988. Um, now, two years later, uh, his youngest brother, John Muston, uh, currently Vice Admiral uh, John Burton Muston, graduated from the Naval Academy in 1990 and went to the uh, guided missile cruiser Vincennes uh, as a SWO, and he served as the CIC officer and the AAW coordinator. From there, he went to the PG school, now in Monterey, of course, uh, where he studied operations research. Uh, from there, he was uh, the pre-commissioning ops officer for uh, the guided missile destroyer Donald Cook, and he, uh, like his brother, uh, transferred to the reserves in 2001, which rounds out the Mustins uh, in the 1990s. I'm retired Rear Admiral John Paddock. I get the distinct honor of serving under Vice Admiral Hank Muston, Commander U.S. Second Fleet, in the mid-80s during the height of the Cold War. Serving also as Sacklands Major Seagoing Commander, Admiral Muston professionally led NATO's Striking Fleet Atlantic in the Alliance's most noteworthy combined joint operational exercises in the Norwegian Sea, extending north of the Arctic Circle. Sharon and I send our warmest personal regards to the McCollum and Muston families on this significant event. The attacks of September 11, 2001, marred the dawn of a promising new century. Once again, the U.S. was at war, this time in Afghanistan. Two years later, the United States began offensive operations to topple successfully the Saddam Hussein regime in Baghdad. However, the U.S. military was not only engaged overseas, but responding at home in the wake of natural disasters, such as Hurricane Katrina and Superstorm Sandy. Over to you, Dave and John. Naval reservists were among the casualties on that tragic September day, 9-11. Uh, Indeed, the Chief of Naval Reserve, John Todeshek, was almost one of the victims when a hijacked American airliner crashed into the Pentagon. Once again, the nation turned to its citizen sailors to provide additional security and support operations in the Middle East and Central Asia. Whereas in past decades, the reserves had been seen as a one-time go-to augmentation force in the time of a major conflict, the long-term nature of the global war on terrorism required a flexible force that can contribute specialized assets when needed. To meet the requirements on the ground, the more likely scenario nowadays is that individuals rather than units will be recalled to provide specialized talents to the active forces. Illustrative of this new reserve force that was now joined at the hip with the active forces uh, were the Mustins. Over to you, John. By 9-11, Lloyd Mustin was a commander. And uh, his very important duty uh, as, uh, in, after the 9-11 was to stand up Site R uh, in Pennsylvania uh, as the um, officer of the Secretary of Defense uh, crisis response cell. Um, and from there, he came back to the Pentagon uh, where he uh, stood watches uh, and worked very closely with uh, Doug Fight. Uh, during that very difficult period of time. So as a reservist, he had a tremendously significant role to play. Likewise, John Muston, uh, in 2004, 2005, uh, returned to active duty as the CO of the Inshore Boat Unit 22. Um, and it was activated, uh, um, and he and his fellow reservists deployed to Kuwait in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom. Uh, so he was uh, in theater uh, during those two years. Um, he made Rear Admiral Lower Half uh, in March 2016. And um, in May 2019, he was promoted to two-star as a plank owner and deputy commander of the reestablished U.S. Second Fleet. Um, so uh, you had these two gentlemen being called up to do... Uh, some tremendous duty and to continue this outstanding legacy as Mustins uh, in the United States Navy and the United States Naval Reserve uh, that goes back 
four generations. An amazing uh, legacy for all of us uh, to learn from. Good morning. I'm Vice Admiral Robin Braun, former Chief of Navy Reserve. I want to offer my sincere congratulations to Vice Admiral Luke and Leanna McCullum on an absolutely outstanding tour as CNR. I also want to welcome and congratulate Vice Admiral John and Kim Muston on their new role leading the men and women of our great Navy Reserve. And now let's send the program back to Admiral Masso. Have a great Navy day. Okay, well, thank you, Admiral Braun. And I think we're, uh, we're all set again. Uh, I just want to uh, reach out to uh, the, the Mustin family, to uh, all of the select reservists who are watching this uh, today from our, our mighty reserve component and our foundation members. And I, it's my pleasure to introduce the 15th Chief of Navy Reserve, Vice Admiral John B. Mustin. Over to you, sir. Well, thank you very much, Sonny. I appreciate the introduction and thank you for the opportunity to uh, address the force here. Um, not lost on me the uh, amount of effort that went into that fantastic video and certainly the number of fingerprints that are on that are impressive. You know, I'd first like to shout out um, my appreciation for the Navy Historical Foundation and your work there and also to the, the, three, the number of uh, former CNRs, Admiral Todeshek, Admiral Cotton, Admiral Debink, Admiral Braun, great to see them. They've all been mentors and friends over the years, so appreciate that. But also, uh, Admiral Julius Caesar, Chris Paul, Admiral Natter, Paddock, uh, uh, and the Secretariat members there, certainly Dino Aviles and others. You know, thank you very much for the contribution and time, and not to be left out, of course, uh, John Morton and Dave Winkler. What, what a fantastic video and, uh, and summary there. I mean, I found myself relearning some old lessons about uh, Navy and, and family lore, so it was great to, to walk through that again. Um, I'm thrilled to address the force and take this opportunity kind of right out of the gate just to share a couple of thoughts and to um, and to help everyone understand where my priorities are, what some of the initiatives that are underway that have my attention and interest are. And I think that that's going to be helpful for us just to, to get out of the blocks with a sense of urgency and uh, in a, in a rigor and enthusiasm that's going to be important to carry us into the future. First and foremo uh, foremost, I have to admit, I am very, very fortunate and thankful to be following on the heels of Admiral Luke McCollum. Uh, he also was a terrific mentor over the years. I learned so much just being in his presence and uh, being a supporting cast member uh, on a number of strategic initiatives that, uh, that he championed. And observing his way of thinking and his way of leading was very informative to me and certainly is going to shape the way that I, I begin my tenure uh, in his former job. I was thrilled to see him. Uh, with a send-off that was certainly suitable under the circumstances and the constraints of COVID. Uh, we certainly made the most of it with the weather conspiring against us too, but it was a glorious uh, send-off. And, and I know that he is appreciating waking up this morning uh, and having a cup of coffee and not worrying so much about uh, the, the heavy burden of running the reserve force. Uh, I, on the other hand, am thrilled to do so. Uh, I want to share a little bit of guidance, just a few top-level thoughts uh, at the wave tops to help our team understand um, what is important to me and, and what shapes my thinking. First and foremost, service is a gift. It, it is something that we should be very thankful for, the opportunity to wear this uniform and to represent our Navy and our nation. And I, I don't think that anyone should ever assume that that is a God-given right. You know, we earn that every day and we represent not only our communities and our families, but, uh, but our great Navy. So, uh, so please, when you wear this uniform, my expectation is you will live and abide by very high standards. Um, I will certainly lead by example in that regard, but my expectations for you are very high. Our mission is incredibly important. As a reserve force, what we do and how we do it has been, become interwoven into the necessities of our Navy. So don't ever underestimate the value that each of you provide to ensuring that the machinery of our institution can function and function efficiently. I'm counting on you to continue to lean into this heavily, and I continue to look for new ways for us to contribute at the tactical level, at the operational level, and at the strategic level. And I can tell you that we are at a time of transformation, and I am open to, to innovative thinking here and my expectations with our staff and some of the leadership within the cell res and FTS population are being tasked with ways to define what our future looks like as we even address the urgent needs of today. My 
overarching umbrella thought that will guide every iota of energy that I put into being your commander is the generation of warfighting readiness. When I speak of warfighting readiness, I'm not talking specifically about mobilization readiness, i.e. dental, medical readiness, GMTs, and PFAs. Those are all very important, but those are responsibilities that every cell res uh, takes upon himself. I expect you to handle those things so that you're ready. That is the cost of entry in our business. More interestingly, I will create the funding mechanisms that will ensure that you can be tactically ready so that we can respond flexibly and in an agile way when the nation calls. It's not enough for us to show up as cell res and say, okay, you know, I've got, uh, I've got the basics done, but now I'm ready to be trained. My expectation is that we're going to use our time and our resources to do the training in advance so that when you arrive on station, you're ready to contribute immediately. I'm not suggesting that that's a tremendous shift from the way that we've been operating recently, but I can tell you that structurally there are some changes that are beneficial to us as a reserve force. Number one is the designation of the Chief of Navy Reserve as a resource sponsor within the Pentagon. And without trying to make everyone a POM expert or a planning, programming, budget, and execution expert, I will just tell you that this provides additional flexibility to us as a force to manage the structures, the units, the individual billets and the, the end strength and headcount with more, um, more flexibility than we have previously had. And that translates down to you as an individual sailor or as a unit CEO, commissioned unit, at a, or even at an OSC or an RCC. It translates down to what is most urgent and important to you. The feedback that you can generate on what you need more of and what we may want to consider divesting is important to me because I want to ensure that our structures are ready to support the readiness of our force. So we talk about ready to win. Uh, cell res certainly are familiar with what that means. Uh, my, my interpretation of ready to win is that it's not a bumper sticker. That is our commitment to our nation, that we are ready to win when we walk in the door. I, I need you to understand my philosophy and thinking on that so that you too can echo that sentiment in all you do when interacting with other sailors and officers, but also with your community. That's an important message that we need to continue to hammer home. Some general thinking about uh, when I walk in the door at the office every day, I wanna share with you uh, a line of reasoning that comes from Jeff Bezos, the CEO and founder of Amazon, where he talks about his culture within his company as a day one mentality. And as a former entrepreneur and small business CEO, I can tell you that the enthusiasm that drove me to start a company and to continue to drive and make the hard decisions to grow a small company uh, resonates as I look at the Navy. The Navy is a large institution. You know, we're 400,000 strong. In the cell res population, we're, we're roughly 60,000. You add in uh, our larger IRR population, it's 110,000. We can move mountains with 110,000 people if we can continue to attack the hard problems with zeal and energy as though it is day one of a startup, okay? So I know that within the institution, there is uh, some inherent bureaucratic friction. You know, it's, it's hard to move quickly in the Pentagon. It's hard to move quickly when it comes to our, uh, our POM or our budget cycles. But I would offer this, rather than simply accepting the fact that the Navy is a large, uh, large business and that we can move kind of with the agility of an aircraft carrier trying to turn, my thinking is I want us to operate like a Mark V SEAL boat, okay? We are, we are required to be agile and responsive, and it's not acceptable for us to simply assume that the inefficiencies of the organization are gonna slow us down, okay? As we look into the future and we begin to assess what transformational elements are gonna drive our future, I'm not talking about transformations over 20 years, I'm talking about transformations over the next 12 months. And I need your help to help me identify those things that are most urgent, but I'm also gonna push hard to make sure that we continue to show progress quickly. Along those lines, an another guiding concept is a, a fantastic book I, I read called The One Thing. I, I use this when I'm mentoring uh, junior officers and other sailors about focusing your bandwidth, your precious bandwidth of every single day on the one thing that you must get done that day. We can, pat ourselves on the back and talk about how busy we are and how many boxes we checked on our task list. But if you didn't get done the one thing that you absolutely must do that day, then your day is wasted. I further extend that and say, okay, when you wake up, you should be thinking about what is the thing today? What is the one thing I have to do this week? What is the one thing I have to get done this month, this quarter, and this year 
So when we look back on 2020, you will always be able to say 2020 is the year that I did this. So I ask for your critical thinking and your ruthless prioritization to identify the most important things that we have to tackle as a group every day, every week, every month, every quarter, and every year. I'm going to give you a couple of thoughts uh, quickly about uh, thinking about our strategic depth um, as well as our operational support assignments and missions. You know, you, if you are unfamiliar about why we have the number of cell res sailors and officers that we do, that is in direct alignment with our strategic depth requirements. We have operational plans for every theater around the world and the requirements for, to execute those plans drive in strength. And that means how many people do we have? We've gotten very good over the last decade and a half, particularly since 9-11 on providing operational support. The Navy, the Navy demands it, expects it, and has grown accustomed to it. And it's important that we continue to provide outstanding operational support. There's a dichotomy, however, between those two, because we have moved in a direction over the last 15 years that has enabled us to find creative ways to provide operational support, often at the expense of the training and readiness to execute against our strategic depth requirements. So everyone understands where my head is. My focus over the near term is gonna to be to identify the strategic requirements and begin to shift the degree and type of operational support that we provide to ensure that the experience you garner during your operational support activities is tied specifically to your operational and strategic requirements. Okay, so, so what may be different to you? I, I'm not suggesting that we won't continue to provide outstanding operational support. That again is the cost of entry for us being cell res sailors. What I do think is I'm gonna to begin to apply a very critical filter to determine what kinds of operational support we're providing and to tie it very directly back to our strategic depth requirements. So stay tuned more on what that means. There are a couple of other key things that are in play now, and I will continue to, uh, to advance the ball. You know, I anecdotally described to some of my friends that, you know, I am the beneficiary of Admiral McCollum's outstanding strategic thinking. In many ways, he did the hard, heavy lifting structurally that enables me to come in the door and now have fun in the execution. Um, I'm very fortunate that the analysis, the data collection, and the rigor that went into my predecessor's tenure tease us up perfectly to execute aggressively in delivering some of the mandates that have been described. I'll give you a couple of examples. It, when I look at our structure, we're not in an environment that allows us to say we can have everything we want all the time. You know, we, we are subject to the same fiscal, cons fiscal constraints that every one of the other deputy CNOs is faced with. When it comes to budgeting, we have to make hard decisions. My filter is going to be, where do we provide the greatest value to the Navy, and in doing so, provide a lethality multiplier to our combat capability? Okay, again, it's not what can we do, it's what must we do. So again, when I look at those structural elements, in some cases, I'm talking about new billets, talking about new capabilities, potentially new units. Those come at the expense of other things. So I am looking very, very, with a very discriminating eye on what is it that we may divest that we have been doing that we must stop doing to enable us to take on those things that will set our stage for the future. What are the future things that, that have my attention right now? Unmanned autonomous vehicles and management, not just the creation of them, but the operation of them. What are the con ops, uh, the concept of operations, and the concepts of employment that will drive our future fleet operations? And how does the RC play into that? There's staff push-ups to be done there, but I'm looking at that very closely. How do we incorporate artificial intelligence, machine learning, data analytics, and frankly, predictive analytics into our thinking, both at the staff level and at the operational fleet level? In conversations with our second fleet commander, Admiral Lewis, just two days ago, I suggested to him that we have the opportunity to tap into the tremendous reserve strength that our wonderful population provides based on civilian skills. So how many folks are oh, you know, operations analysis or operations research experts that do this in their civilian capacity? And we can bring that to bear to enable faster, more rigorous, more holistic thinking about asset employment at the fleet level, okay? This isn't just about driving spreadsheets better within the Pentagon or the Beltway. What I'm talking about is taking the ability now to provide predictive analytics and apply it to tactical and operational thinking at the fleet level. I think we've got some depth there and I wanna explore that. 
there's something called the FTS rebalance. So what we found is our 10,000 strong FTS population is doing great work around the fleet. What we're not doing in all cases, however, is FTS missions. So in some cases, we're going to harvest our FTS billets to reassign them to do the things that are most important for our reserve force. Uh, not suggesting that we're going to take anybody out of current billets, but I will offer that there are a couple of different enterprises throughout the Navy that are large consumers of FTS talent, and yet they're not given back to the RC fleet or the RC force. That's important to me that we do that because we pay a lot of money to ensure that we have those billets, the right types and uh, the right seniority. And I want to make sure that we're getting the greatest value out of those billets. Tied closely on the heels of the FTS rebalance initiative is something called NOS consolidation. So when we look at the number of NOS, we've got 123 today. As of the first of next month, we'll be down to 122 as we close down Youngstown. There's future opportunity, I think, to consolidate NOS, not because we're in a BRAC environment, but because we can consolidate the bodies associated with those NOS and redeploy them to a smaller number of NOSs to plus up the density of FTS personnel and civilians at each NOS. So I, I think... Um, Several factors come into play. What are NOS that are on installation or off installation? And what is the ATFP implication of those things? And, and how can, you know, when we look at the number of cell res and or units associated with a NOS that may be remote, is it better to assign those sailors to a larger NOS just to create kind of a hub and spoke uh, uh, kind of network around which our sailors can still check in? While we're talking about NOS, I would tell you our cell res sailors do their best work when they're tied to their gaining commands. In some cases in the breadbasket of America, it's hard to get to fleet concentration areas, and I understand that. But frankly, my preference would be using technology where possible, we continue to engage in the first, first order with our gaining commands. You know, we get less, at, other than some rudimentary training, we don't get the tactical and operational expertise that we need by sitting in a NOS. Okay, I, I want to get everyone down to the waterfront. I want to get you into the squadron base as, as much as we can. And I can scare up a lot of IDTT. And I know for the folks at the NOS listening, you know what that means. But if you ever are fed a line that says, I'd like to go work with the gaining command, but we don't have a IDTT, I want you to send me a note at john.muston at navy.mil. And, and we're going to get to the bottom of it because I can get IDT for each of you to travel. We also have a wonderful initiative called IDTR. For those of you who are traveling to the NOSC in certain ratings and certain units, we're going to pay you up to $500 a month to get to drill. Okay, it's that important to us that we continue to, uh, to remove the barriers and the friction and the processes that enable your success. Okay, I, I mentioned a little bit about what a resource sponsorship means to us now within the Pentagon. Uh, it's going to be hard work, but my, my understanding and my appreciation for the hard work that got us into the resource sponsorship game now enables us to perform at a level where our civilian and our military leaders will get greater flexibility because we can move faster and we can establish priorities both with funding and with personnel even faster. So uh, I will leave you with, uh, with one final thought, which is I couldn't be happier to be here. I couldn't be more thrilled to follow in the big shoes that Admiral McCullum leaves behind. But with that said, we've got a lot of work to do. It's an exciting time to be in our Navy and in our Navy Reserve. And I couldn't be more honored to be your commander. And I'm ready to answer some questions. Admiral Masso, over to you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for those uh, uh, amazing remarks and uh, commander's intent. And I think that uh, I speak as a former uh, select reservist for all select reserves, that uh, the leadership getting this jump start is, is very important and we appreciate it. We have a lot of questions, and I'm going to kind of try to bundle them a little bit to, to be more efficient. And, uh, and frankly, there's a couple questions for Dr. Dave and for, uh, for John Morton as well. So I'll try to be, be as economical about that as physically possible. So uh, I think there's a lot of people, based on the comments that have come in, who are uh, uh, wondering a little bit more about what it means to be a resource sponsor. And specific uh, to that those, that that. Uh, wonderment is the fact that resource sponsors typically man, equip, train. So there's a, you know, you can see where you man and equip, but maybe you don't train because obviously that comes, uh, you know, with the supported command. But but uh, if you could just uh, park on uh, what it means now to be a resource sponsor, how it's similar, but how it's different than uh, the traditional definition. 
You bet. Yeah, thanks for teeing that one up. And again, my, my intent here is not to make everybody a, a palm expert in a short call like this, but but historically we've been at the mercy of the OpNav N9 shop. And Admiral Kilby, who is there now, is uh, you know is, is certainly a, a wonderfully strategic thinker. But at the end of the day, if you look at, for instance, in the expeditionary world in 95 or in the surface world in 96 or submarines is 97 and aviators is 98, they are the owners at the two star level of the budgets and the budget decisions that drive not only the um, the purchase of additional airframes or boats, but also the, the end strength. So end strength is a fancy word for, for bodies. So, you know, when we look at our 59,000 strong cell res population, again, we got 10,000 FTS and, and 49,000 cell res. The folks who are paying for those are the resource sponsors. So if you notice over the last 10 years, you know, we've seen as many as 150,000 cell res population. You know, right now we're at 49,000 and we're doing great analysis to determine down to the body what our end strength count will be at the end of this fiscal year and then project it out for every subsequent year into the future, the future the defense plan. So the resource sponsorship initiative for us now means that, that we own the dollars associated with our operations and maintenance money. So when we operate all our SNAFR units and all the squadrons and the augment units, as well as operating our force with NECC as well as uh, looking at how we're employing our cell res with our RPN, which is Reserve Program Navy Dollars. So for the, you in the audience, that's your ADT and your IDTT. It means now instead of being subject to the mercy and the whims of others who are making decisions on our behalf, we will drive the budgets to define how much we need for each of those pots of money. So that's important because Resource sponsorship is difficult. Again, we don't have an endless supply of money and we have to be good stewards of the civilian taxpayer dollars. But but I don't want N95, uh, General Tracy King saying, hey, I need to fund a new amphib, so I'm gonna cut 2,900 billets at, uh, at NECC, cell res billets, you know? And, um, and our ability now, not only to continue working with the other resource sponsors, but to have some ownership over those decisions is helpful. One final note on this, and I don't wanna go too long to anchor on this comment, but we have to make hard decisions every day. Okay, so it's not enough to say, okay, well, it's A or B. You know, you either get an amphib, a new amphib, uh, or you get cell res headcount. It's, it's not that simple. Uh, but in many cases, it's that hard. And what I would offer is by being a resource sponsor now, we can understand the requirement and come up with the courses of action to address the requirement. That's frankly where I see the most opportunity here is I can work with our expeditionary experts, our aviators, our submariners, our surface warfare ex experts to say, let me help you find the right so solution at the right dollar value. It's a mix of AC and RC, and I can help you by determining how the RC can play at a lower cost to create greater value and greater lethality. Okay, that's I, thank, you very, thank you very much on that one. Uh, a couple questions from the, the uh, field, uh, from the NOSCs, the NOSCs, uh, or do you have any immediate plans to visit any? And of course, I think everyone appreciates the pandemic and probably the answer to that is likely not that many, but uh, you know, where would you think you'd need to go first? And then also given the pandemic, are there some best practices that we've learned from our NOSCs and how they're interacting with their workforce and their sailors? You, you bet. Hey, thanks. Another great question for, uh, for whoever asked that one. So first and foremost, I, I wanna get out and engage with the force as much and as frequently as possible. Right now, obviously, the COVID constraints are, are driven largely by the, the population and the COVID reactions in those populations, you know, kind of from a green region to a green region is okay, but from a green to a red incurs uh, some restricted on movement uh, sequestration for two weeks. So, so the short answer is, I am absolutely energized to get out and to see the force across our great nation. In the short term, it's probably unlikely that I, I will do so other than some of the fleet concentration areas, because if I'm going to travel, I need to make sure that there's value in the travel. So it's tougher for me to get out to a single NOSC in a, in a state uh, in the middle of the country uh, because of the time and distance constraints there. If I can get to places like San Diego, where I want to get uh, relatively soon, because I can see both our surface type commander as well as our air type commander and our SNAFR commander. And I can see some of our hardware squadrons, you know, for instance, uh, Jacksonville is a high likelihood because of what's going on at Mayport and Jax. Um, so short answer, I'm probably gonna look at uh, areas where I can interact with the force in a tactical and operational level, less so in my ADCON or administrative hat, 
Um, you know, I do have Admiral John Schomer, who's the commander of the Navy Reserve Forces Command. He and I will work together to determine when it's appropriate to get to the NOSCs and the regions. You know, my intent really is to interact with our S2 four-star fleet commanders and our Echelon 3 type commanders and SISCOMs so that I can hear kind of what's on their mind and define, you know, active duty Navy requirements and then play that back to some of our cell rest populations that are in the, in the vicinity. So short answer, can't wait to get out there. Unfortunately, uh, not likely to do so all around this great country until we get some restrictions on COVID. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, we've, we, uh, uh, first of all, we've had some people, uh, foundation members in that who wonder what an OSC is and that, and I'll answer that question. It's the Naval Operational Support Center, formerly known as Navy Reserve Center or Navy Readiness Reserve Center. And uh, that was uh, redefined under the Cotton administration and has endured. And, uh, and, and it really makes sense because of the transition from the, uh, the strategic reserve to the operational reserve transition. Uh, we have had some questions from some, we, and, and I know that you know that we have some very capable and impressive enlisted uh, personnel who have big day jobs. And uh, just because they haven't uh, transitioned to say to, to become an officer, that doesn't mean they're not highly successful in what they're doing in that. And uh, your comments about artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, data optimization, data analytics, predictive analytics, blockchain, you didn't mention, but it's all part and parcel of the same thing. The question is by some of these very impressive enlisted personnel is how are you gonna reach out to them so they can share what their backgrounds are in these areas. And then uh, what will you do with that? Yeah, fantastic. So we have a mechanism in place already to tap into this. So, you know, for the, for the cell resident audience, the CEI database, you know, civilian skills database, completely um, um, uh, optional, however, strongly encouraged that, you know, this is a great example. If, if you identify yourself as an expert, you are forbidden by law from being mobilized as a result of this capability. So, so I want to dispel a big myth that I understand has, has hindered uh, a number of initiatives over the years to get folks to declare where they have very unique or specific skill sets like this. My hope is over time, we will, we will begin to populate the CEI database with additional skill sets like, you know, additive manufacturing, 3D printing, you know, those uh, special language skills. Those are all examples where we've had folks in the past identify them and what it does is it allows us at the CNR level, the CNRFC level, to say there are opportunities. If you are interested, we can get you ADT funding or ADSW or ADOS. Uh, again, I don't want to uh, burden everybody with all the acronyms, but I think the audience who needs to understand that will understand it. You know, my point is, if you tell us what you can do, we may ask you if you want to do it in uniform. Again, we're not going to tap to you and say, hey, you're getting mobilized because you have expertise. Again, we're forbidden by law to do that. So that's not going to happen. But for those of you who have very specific skills in those areas, uh, you know, I want to hear from you. And, and the way to do it, the mechanism is, is already in place is the CEI database. One, one final point on this too is another area of great growth for us is what my friend uh, Admiral Gene Price is doing with the NAP I-4 uh, enterprise now within the IWC community. You know, cyber, intel, crypto. These are things where we're going to double down and we're going to continue to pump up and grow our force. That, that is an area of high growth for us. And, you know, sorry, while I'm on a, a, another one. So expeditionary logistics, that's another area too, is we work with our naval integration partners, the Marine Corps, to determine how we're going to do, you know, expeditionary advanced base operations. Our expeditionary logistics capability is a huge part of that. So that's another area for potential growth. Um, I would tell you it's, it's very pre-decisional. Um, probably not even wise for me to mention on my first day on the job here, but I, I am looking very carefully at, um, at what the validity and opportunity may be to resurrect uh, a couple of surface assets within the reserve force. There's, uh, there are some options. I will certainly talk to the SWO boss about this and see what those opportunities are. But, um, but you know, I, I lived in the uh, FFG and Class Ron era. I, I don't think we're going to stand up a surface reserve force again. However, there may be surface reserve assets afloat. So stay tuned on that. Um, obviously, some staff calories to burn before we make any declaration there, but it's something that has my attention. Uh, another question has come up uh, with respect to diversity, inclusion, awesome. programs, initiatives. Uh, thing, your, what are your general thoughts? Uh, no one's, the way that the questions are coming, 
uh, no one's holding your feet to the fire or anything, but they just want to know what your thoughts are, uh, just given yeah. that on your first day. Oh, absolutely. Well, hey, no surprise. You know, our Navy is a diverse force. I, there are things that we do very well already. In fact, in many cases, kind of lead society, I think, in, in our perspective about diversity. But, you know, as, as a personal commander, I would say diversity starts with good mentoring. And that can be at the echelon one level as the commander like me, or at the echelon five level as a unit skipper. You know, the expectation that there is good mentoring to help push down the culture and the, and the expectations about this. Very simply, you know, we are not, we're, we're not going to discriminate or hold against anyone race, gender, ethnicity, religion, um, disability, sexual orientation. You know, those things are irrelevant today. Uh, I, I think when I looked, you know, as we were watching great clips of my great granddad and grandfather and father, you know, the Navy has evolved a lot in 105 years since the reserve force has been around. In some cases, we're not where we need to be. I know that. And I'm going to work very ha hard with uh, Admiral Paul Halsey, who stood up the Task Force One Navy. You know, I'm, I'm working very closely with our SNAFR commander, Admiral Scott Jones, who's going to be tied at the hip with me to push the diversity issues and inclusiveness within our reserve force. And again, I'm doing this tied very closely with what the CNO is doing because we understand that the diversity of thinking, the diversity of experience and perception, those things make our Navy better. Okay, so if you're looking to surround yourself as a, as a commander with people who look, act and think like you, you're missing the boat. Okay, we make better decisions with a diverse uh, population. So, so my perspective on this is I, I'm going to seek out diversity of all of those topics so that we get better decisions. And I would even tell you, you know, there's a couple of organizations that deserve a shout out here. I mean, I, I know for instance, um, when I think of what uh, Sink Harris, you know, Admiral Sinclair Harris is doing at uh, NNOA. So the um, uh, National Naval Officers Association, you know, they've got mentoring programs set up specifically to enable not only our cell res officers, but, uh, but a larger population to engage in these conversations to get better at it. You know, that's one. And then um, the Naval Academy Minority Association, NAMA, also uh, run by just a superstar, legendary uh, character, Admiral Julius Caesar, who you saw in this video. You know, it's, it's led by um, the admin board, but really run by, by JC as the director. So that's another organization that exists to make, uh, to make us better, stronger, and, and understand more. So, you know, that's, that's kind of a long answer, but I would tell you, I've had several conversations, even in my transition over the last week, with other flags saying, this is an issue that is very important to me, because we got to get this right. And, and I'll just commit to you now, we're going to get it right, you know, and we're going to do it in conjunction with what the CNO is doing and Bull Halsey is doing. But, but we're a big player here, because we represent uh, a closer kind of tapestry society of society. So we have a better sense of what's going on outside of the uniform that we can bring into uniform to make it better. Thank you, sir. Uh, it, with your permission, I'm going to uh, segue to to, to uh, Dr. Dave Winkler, and I'll come back to you for the final word. Uh, Dr. Dave, you've had a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, a lot of compliments on your book, and uh, and, and if you uh, reach out to us at uh, NavyHistory.org, if you're looking for a copy of that, you know we'll we'll find a way to get it to you. But a couple questions uh, for you, Dr. Dave. Write them down. Why is there um, you know, how do we characterize, I guess, uh, are we Navy Reserve or Naval Reserve? That's one. Uh, there was another question about uh, Naval militias. And of course, I drilled in uh, uh, New York two times. I drilled in Anosk and uh, Syracuse and also in Albany when I had Striking Fleet Atlantic, part of the second fleet. But uh, the, the, a lot of people, if you were a cell res, you could join the New York Naval Militia. And it was very big, very prestigious and uh, very capable, uh, believe it or not. And the, uh, uh, so, but is there any other states that, that have that uh, similar alignment or have retained their own militia? And then uh, finally, uh, what, is there anything you'd wanna comment on between the Army's experience with militias represented by the National Guard and, and then our own Navy Reserve today? So that was a lot, but uh, why don't you see what you can do with those? Okay, now that's, well, first of all, during World War I, of course, you went into World War I, you had these naval, state naval militia units already established, and then we formed the naval, uh, federal, at the time was the uh, Naval Reserve Force, was created uh, 
actually by legislation in 1916. Uh, and there was a consolidation between the two groups uh, in 1918, uh, you know, uh, because it served the same purpose. Now, New York is the one state that really kept their naval militia going because New York has had, you know, the, the naval militia has served uh, harbor defense purposes and uh, they uh, re re mobilized, for example, in the aftermath of 9-11, uh, you know, to support uh, uh, what happened then. Other states, I, I know New Jersey uh, has reestablished a naval militia. I think South Carolina, I think California uh, have, and, and these are units kind of like an analogous to National Guard units that are you know, responsible to the, you know, the governors. So, uh, you know, that's, uh, uh, but in, the, in contrast, National Guard units, you know, they're really a, a strong, uh, each state has their National Guard units, but they're also closely tied to, you know, uh, to support the Army. And there's several National Guard units that, for example, mobilized you know, to support operations in Afghanistan. You haven't seen that with the Naval Militias. Now, Naval Reserve, Navy Reserve, that, again, that was something that uh, uh, Vice Admiral John Cotton decided when he was Chief of Navy Reserve, it, it was Naval Reserve, but Navy Reserve is to kind of emphasize the fact that we're all one Navy, uh, you know, we're, we're not part of a, uh, so that that was kind of a, uh, a messaging that was uh, done at the time to uh, emphasize that we're all part of the same team. Great, thank you very much. And for John Morton, uh, this question uh, uh, specifically addresses uh, uh, Admiral uh, Hank Mustin, uh, particularly in his role of uh, Commander of the United States Second Fleet and other critical jobs that he had. Um, in a manner of speaking, when uh, the Aegis uh, Combat Systems came out vis-a-vis -vis the Ticonderoga class, and then those Flight 2 cruisers beginning with Bunker Hill, with vertical launch systems, and and uh, uh, more complex electronic warfare and things like that. He was the person that instantiated doctrinally, uh, you know, the, 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 the whole uh, nature of, of en enhancing the force uh, and, and bringing really more power, you know, to play. Uh, is there anything you'd like to say about that and, and how he assimilated all that? And clearly he was working with, uh, you know, Vice Admiral Doyle and others as a mentor, but uh, did, did you have any recollections or anecdotes about that? Uh, because he really uh, kind of was in, in a leadership role in a very magical time for our Navy, very transformational. Well, I think it, uh, it actually gets into uh, uh, his, uh, his technical expertise. Uh, I think I've mentioned before that uh, he had a philosophy that a naval officer was not so much a manager, if at all, but with management skills, but was a technical engineer uh, that uh, could really understand and if necessarily with hands-on deal with the technical issues aboard a ship uh, at the deck plate level. And I think John or Admiral Mustin might be able to comment on that as well, because I'm sure that would have uh, pertain to the way he was raised in Hank Mustin's uh, household. Um, Hank always emphasized that he came back to OPNAV from Vietnam at a time when the surface Navy uh, really was, uh, I don't wanna say a backwater in his mind, but it, it, it got short shrift from the succession of aviators that had uh, senior uh, positions at the flag level. And to a certain extent, as far as the strategic uh, community was concerned, uh, the uh, sub submariners uh, and the folks that were working you know, with submarines as part of the strategic triad. So the surface Navy was, was really uh, short shrifted. Uh, and it was only when Zumwalt came in as CNO and you had through the 70s, uh, admirals like uh, Jim Doyle and Ted Parker that Hank worked with uh, that were able to articulate and understand how the Navy could get into a uh, resuscitated uh, strike capability, particularly in the Atlantic, 
where instead of being the convoy escort for the Atlantic Bridge, it actually could play a role um, that was concomitant with what the Army and the Air Force was doing as an offensive capability. Uh, and that, I think, uh, relates to the Mustin tradition of not seeing uh, a warrior or an institution uh, being uh, a defensive institution. It was really, I always remember Lloyd saying, uh, when I was rather enamored of the Strategic Defense Initiative, he'd say, Johnny, you know, <laughs> there's no such thing as a defensive weapon. When the Roman soldier had been without his sword, he would take his shield and use it to bash the head of the enemy. I think Hank's, Hank's notion of the surface Navy was to bring it into the latter part of the 20th century and the Aegis combat system and all that went with it, the land attack tomahawks and whatnot, to uh, restore the offensive capabilities uh, of the surface forces in the Navy. I, I'd say that was that, that's the only insight I can provide. Well, great. Well, that was a, a great answer to a very good question. And I want to thank all of uh, our audience for their questions. And I'm, I'm going to before I hand it over uh, to uh, Vice Admiral Mustin uh, with our warmest congratulations, uh, I just want to speak on behalf of our Chairman, Admiral Bill Fallon, our President, uh, Frank Pandolf, Vice Admiral Frank Pandolf, our board. Uh, this was an amazing event. We thank all of our viewers for uh, participating. We will get this uploaded to YouTube as all of our content is on YouTube now. Uh, we uh, encourage you to consider joining and becoming a member if, uh, if you liked what you saw. And uh, we certainly have a uh, quarterly periodical I think you'll like called Pull Together. We have a Thursday Tidings that comes out each Thursday. And, uh, and we really believe that our foundation exists for you. So why don't you come join us and be part of it. Um, Vice Admiral Mustin, uh, warmest, warmest congratulations. Uh, we're so thrilled for your uh, you know, you're now time to, to lead a very important part of our nation's defense. And uh, I leave the last words over to you, sir. Uh, fantastic. Well, thanks again, Sonny. And, uh, and please pass my regards and appreciation to, um, to Admiral uh, Fowler and uh, Pandoff. Obviously, uh, very, very thankful for their time and, and enabling this to happen uh, first and foremost. Uh, one quick one, I think I just want to give a shout out to uh, to John Morton there and say, hey, it may be appropriate now to start talking about the epilogue to the book, because I know you cover the 20th century, but but my eye is in the 21st century here. So uh, we may be needing to get that follow on with uh, with my nephew, Link Mustin, who's a uh, lieutenant commander in the Navy right now working at N82 in the Pentagon. Um, all right. Well, hey, I'll, I'll leave it with this. Our, our Navy Reserve Force just celebrated our 105th anniversary. Uh, we are terrifically proud of the work that's happened over that century, and, and you heard an awful lot about the contributions that we've made. And yet, I would tell you, as, as pleased and proud as I am about what we've done, I'm even more energized about what I know what we're going to do. And, you know, we've got a lot of work to do to ensure that we're ready both to address the urgent, critical needs of today, but really more importantly is to ensure that we're preparing ourselves structurally and operationally for for what is inevitably going to happen in the future. And as I mentioned yesterday, you know, any, anyone who wakes up thinking that they're gonna win tomorrow's wars with today's force structure or tactics or thinking is, uh, is in, engaged in a fool's errand. So we need to get smart. We're gonna, we're gonna look obviously with kind of a weather eye about what's coming down the pipe and how we can, how we can get ahead of that. So, so my focus uh, as a top line thought is about war fighting readiness and the degree to which the reserve force integrates into our Navy's combat power. And uh, I think there's no stronger signal than that than me standing in front of this hot pink background to uh, reinforce my warfighting readiness. So, uh, again, hey, listen, thanks to everybody here. Uh, Admiral Masso, great to see you. John Morton, thanks so much for, your, for what you've done and, and that great rendition today. Dave Winkler, always a pleasure, sir. Um, and to the many folks who are not on the screen but who contributed to, uh, to putting this together, uh, BZ to all of you. Thanks, thanks so much out here.